and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, you can see that the title of this evening's discussion, and I do hope it is a discussion, is a little bit different from the title of the book. The title of the book is Churchill's American Arsenal, uh, the innovation, the partnership behind the innovations that won World War II. Um, please note the aircraft that uh, Winston Churchill is looking at. Please pay, pay attention to that. The title of this uh, uh, discussion this evening is Churchill's American Armada, uh, because it focuses on two of the many, many um, examples of how Britain and the United States collaborated to build the war-winning inventions of the Second World War. And in this case, it's the um, landing ship tank program, which Newport News is well known for, and the Liberty Ship program, uh, which also has ties to this area. Uh, many uh, inventions and weapons were credited with winning World War II. Probably the most famous quote is by Lee Dubridge, who was the head of the MIT Radiation Laboratory, responsible for building many of the radars. And he had vested interest in this. Um, he said, the atom bomb only ended the war, radar won it. So you can attribute the uh, victory of World War II to many things. In fact, um, uh, almost any one of these could be given some kind of title. Uh, airborne radar. Uh, I'm sure many of you are anxious to see Masters of the Air coming to, um, is it Apple TV? Is it the, is Apple TV coming soon? Um, in the middle, that's the P-51 Mustang, the all-American fighter, except that you notice that Winston Churchill was standing next to the first models. That's because the British uh, specified the airplane, gave the money to the United States to build it, built the factories. Um, it was a uh, German-American engineer who designed the Mustang with the help of a British aerodynamicist. And when the plane was put into full operation, in this configuration, it was uh, constructed with a British Rolls-Royce engine. All-American fighter? No. Um, British-bred American-born. Um, penicillin, another British invention that was mass-produced in the United States. The atomic bomb was a British idea that was brought to the United States. We'll be talking about liberty ships and landing ships tanks. Um, all of them could be con uh, 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 could be considered as helping turn the tide of the war. All of them had the distinct uh, uh, characteristic of being a collaboration between two nations, Britain and the United States, to bring to fruition. Um, in this talk, I'm just going to be talk uh, focused on the bottom two. The idea of a special relationship is first and foremost in our minds, but that certainly wasn't the case uh, when the Germans had swept across Europe in June 1940, uh, had uh, uh, occupied most of the continent, threatened to cut off the sea lanes, and certainly threatened to invade Britain. Complete submission seemed imminent, uh, but it was only by combining the scientific and engineering talents of Britain and the United States to develop weapons and inventions that could defeat the Nazi uh, war machine? Could they hope to turn the tide of war, retake the continent, and finish the job? And yes, um, this book and this discussion is primarily focused on the European theater, knowing that World War II was the largest conflict in mankind that took place on every single continent, including Antarctica. So it is impossible to take in the entire conflict. This is going to focus on one important part of the war. And probably most important is, at this time, um, that special relationship between Britain and the United States had yet to be forged. At the beginning of the war, uh, France and Britain were the two nations that had the special relationship. You may remember, they had defeated Germany in World War I together. Yes, they had some help from the United States, but they were primarily responsible. And they were very closely allied during the very early stages of the Second World War. And more importantly, together they outnumbered and outproduced the Germans. On paper, 
Britain and France together could defeat Germany. Britain certainly didn't think that it needed to come to the United States for help, except maybe in a few minor uh, areas of aircraft and machine tools. It was the lightning defeat of both the British forces and the French forces um, in May and June of 1940 that changed this dynamic completely. Not only was France now out of the picture, but as you can see uh, from this left-hand photograph, although 330,000 Allied troops uh, were saved from the beaches of Dunkirk, tens of thousands of weapons and pieces and, and, and tanks and uh, other equipment were left on the countryside, roads, and on the beaches of Dunkirk. In other words, the British Army was back at home, but they were toothless. Um, it was only after um, uh, this uh, rapid uh, uh, retrenchment that the Blitz and the Battle of Britain began, and they started to, the Germans started to systematically destroy the factories and the shipyards that Britain needed to rebuild in order to take uh, the continent. Fighting on the beaches, fighting on the seas and oceans, uh, British shipyards especially, which were overburdened and under attack, could not possibly build enough ships, and this was the largest shipbuilding nation on earth, uh, to bring the troops necessary, the armor, to retake Europe. Churchill had just become prime minister, and he knew that Britain uh, could not uh, even hope to rebuild its army, then increase its army, and then be able to take that army across the channel to uh, uh, reconquer Europe without American help. Dunkirk had completely changed the equation. It was at this point that Britain came to the United States to ask for help, um, not just to, for, for with money, but also to uh, produce uh, weapons that Britain had been developing over the years and to take British ideas and inventions and make them industrial products. Uh, some of you have heard of the Lend-Lease program. That was the program that allowed the Americans to essentially build uh, many of these weapons, many of these um, pieces of equipment, uh, more or less on credit uh, with the very thin promise that they would be returned after the war in good condition, which uh, everybody understood was going to be uh, a, a lot, uh, not, not going to happen, but it gave uh, Roosevelt the ability to sign into law probably one of the most important acts of uh, that part of this, uh, of the 20th century. As I said, I'm going to talk about two of many examples. Uh, they are the Liberty ships and the landing ships tank. So we'll start with Liberty ships, and you may uh, remember this scene from uh, the movie Greyhound, great movie. Um, and the Liberty ships, which we think of as being this uh, wonderful American innovation of um, how to get things done quickly uh, as an all-American product, began life as a British program. And it started with these two. Um, and I'm going to use the word men uh, because the primary um, uh, actors in many of these dramas were men, but there are incredibly important areas where I'll be talking about uh, the other half of the equation. Uh, on the left-hand side, that's Robert Cyril Thomas. He was managing director of Thompson & Sons Shipyards in Britain near Newcastle. And they produced uh, very efficient but slow ships, they're about 10 knots, uh, for cargo transport. Uh, when Britain realized that they uh, needed to uh, supplement the shipbuilding that they already had, as I had mentioned, the shipyards were under attack, uh, the shipyards were producing uh, carriers, battleships, they were repairing war damaged ships. Um, so they needed a, another source to build merchant ships. Uh, they asked uh, Thompson to lead what was called the um, uh, British Merchant Ship Mission 
to come to the United States uh, and ask for 60 ships to be built uh, in and around uh, the, the states. In the space of two weeks from October to November of 1940, uh, they hired a, a plane and visited 30 sites over the course of just two weeks. They never slept in a hotel. They slept on the airplane as it flew from one destination to another. Finally, they decided um, to work with uh, the person on the right, um, Henry J. Kaiser, that's his wife, Bess, um, who was known better as a civil engineering genius, frankly. Uh, he was responsible for uh, the Grand Coulee Dam, now the Hoover Dam, uh, many other civil projects. And one thing he knew how to build was infrastructure. And he'd already constructed two shipyards that were building ships while the shipyard was being built around the ships. So the British Merchant Ship Mission contracted with Kaiser in two different uh, sites. One was Richmond on the west coast near San Francisco. The other one was Portland, Maine to build what were called um, ocean class ships. They were essentially the same ship that Thompson was building in Britain, just built to um, American industrial standards. It was a very inexperienced team that Kaiser brought to the shipyards. In fact, and this is in congressional testimony, one of the shipyard managers turned to uh, his associate and said, so when do we pour the keel? And I, I wish I was making that up, but that, that actually was said. Um, but they knew what they were doing when it came to constructing shipyards. Um, once the contract was let, uh, let me get the figures uh, here. Um, they began construction two weeks after the contract, and the first ships were coming off the line uh, within four months after the contract was signed. Thompson himself only stayed for the initial signing of the contract. He then went back to Britain by fast passenger ship, but it wasn't fast enough to escape the U-boats. His ship was struck by a torpedo, sunk. Thompson managed to get off the ship um, into lifeboats. Um, many of the passengers survived, and he was uh, 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 had his wits about him. He got the, he, he kept the contract for the uh, for these ocean class ships and the shipyards in his briefcase, took it with him on the lifeboat. He was rescued after several days, um, came home, dried out the contracts, had them retyped. They were signed, and they were. But they, by this time, they were already building the ships. But you couldn't simply take a British plan and build it in an American shipyard. Now I'm a naval architect. I've been designing ships for many years, and I had the opportunity of being trained as a British naval constructor and working in the French Navy. So I've seen firsthand the difference between construction plans in each country, and it's, it's like looking at a Leonardo da Vinci drawing with you know, backwards lettering. You, know, you can't simply take it and, and, and work on it. You have to translate it into American. And the company that did that was Gibbs and Cox. This is William Francis Gibbs on the cover of Time Magazine. And some of you may be familiar with the company because their archives used to be here in the museum. I've actually made uh, great use of them. They're now over in Christopher Newport. Um, uh, you may have also had uh, the biographer of William Francis Gibbs, Stephen Ujifusa who wrote uh, the book, A Man and His Ship. Uh, wonderful book. If you have a chance to get it after you buy my book, um, please do. It's a, it's a great portrait of uh, William Francis Gibbs and the company that he created, which became one of the most important engineering companies of World War II. Um, something like 70% of all of the um, US Navy fleet was designed by his firm. And Thompson was quite impressed uh, in Britain, the, uh, the shipyards did their own drawings. They did their own plans. Uh, this was the first time he came across a naval architecture firm. They didn't exist. Thompson was wary, but he was very impressed. He said, British marine engineers and builders, um, and th this explains what Gibson Cox did. Um, 
tend to leave many details off the drawings. Footnote, um, that's because many British engineers start work in the factories before they move to the drawing rooms and then into the engineering offices. So when they come to the engineering offices, they know how the factory works and they can, they can write on the drawings to shop floor standard. And everybody knows what that means. But in the United States, engineers, and this is true today, um, are tra were trained to put every single nut, bolt, and, and widget and, and rivet um, onto the drawings because there wasn't that same factory floor engineering drawing room standard. And so uh, 80 drawings might suffice to build an engine in Britain. And, and this is true. Um, when the Americans got it and they, they saw 80 drawings, they wired back, said, we asked for all the drawings. And the British said, those are all the drawings. And they had to come up with 500 more drawings before they could build the engine. So this is an unsung part of the enormous work that went into making the fleet that became the Liberty ships. And you can see the DNA of the Liberty ship. There's the Liberty ship at the bottom, but the ship at the top is where it all began. So just to recap the history, um, Thompson's shipyard was building what was called the Empire Class, Empire Wave, etc. cetera. Uh, and that was the ship that the Americans agreed to build for the British as the Ocean Class, which was the ship at the bottom. 60 of them were built by the uh, Americans. Meanwhile, Britain built another 20 of these uh, Empire Class, and then Canada built another 200 uh, of these same British ships because they had very similar um, uh, engineering and, and shipbuilding to, to the British. But Gibbs and Cox took the Empire class drawings, translated them into American drawings. They became the Ocean class. So as uh, the Kaiser Yards were building them, and I'm going to refer to my notes here, uh, the first one was actually launched in um, August of uh, 1941, put into commission. Um, the Maritime Commission, which was in charge of the American emergency cargo fleet, decided it also needed uh, inexpensive but quick to build uh, cargo ships, looked around, said, we want those ocean ships, we want another 2,700 of them. And so they took the ocean class, they just made them into Liberty ships. That's why I said the Americans just took over the British and they remade them into Liberty ships and built, um, started put, getting them off the construction line. The first one was the SS Patrick Henry that was launched in September of 1941. Um, so while the British were building, the Americans were building on alongside uh, and it became, uh, as you can see, a total of 3,000 ships uh, from that one design, probably the largest uh, single class of ocean-going ships in modern history from that one design by Thompson. But it wasn't just Liberty ships, it was also liberty from discrimination, both for women and for minorities, at least for a little while, and perhaps in a very limited way. One of the things that the shipyards were faced with right away is lack of literal manpower. Probably you all know that most of the men were either called to duty or they were serving in some other way. And in order to fill the um, enormous uh, production calls, not just in shipyards, but in aircraft factories, et cetera, uh, women and minorities uh, stepped up. And very often it was both. Um, here you can see um, several uh, African-American women working in the Kaiser shipyards in Richmond, Virginia. And no, that isn't Rosie the Riveter. Riveting was the old technology. These were state-of-the-art um, uh, engineers and fabricators, these Wendy welders. And their names are given in the National Archives, which I was very happy to see because so often uh, there are faces, but you don't see the names. And these women, and there were many men, uh, were responsible for creating these fleets. 
But women working in the shipyards were faced with other problems. Number one, um, child care. So for a period of time, the US government funded shipyards and other companies to provide child care on site, and uh, the companies themselves were providing health care on site. Kaiser Shipyards and Permanente Metals in particular. Um, this woman, that's um, uh, Hannah Peters, had been born in Germany, but uh, she moved to California and she was uh, hired by the Kaiser Shipyards and Permanente Metals um, to make certain that their women were being taken care of um, because they had different problems than, than, than the men did. And they, she started one of the first um, gynecological departments. Um, and they were caring for 23,000 staff. Um, there were similar expansions in other shipyards. And if the names Kaiser Shipyard and Permanente Metals means anything to you, it's probably because the only vestige of that once powerful shipyard conglomerate is now Kaiser Permanente, the, the healthcare organizations that they had created to take care of their workers, not just the women, men also, um, became the Kaiser Permanente um, group and Kaiser Healthcare. Uh, and that's really what started the whole process of linking uh, American healthcare to American um, employers. Ultimately, there were 18 shipyards around the United States that built the Liberty ships. This is from the Smithsonian's um, rather antiquated, frankly, exhibit on uh, shipping, which I do hope one day will be brought back up to um, uh, uh, made a little bit more uh, modern. Uh, some of those ships were built under the uh, Newport News shipbuilding flag uh, in a shipyard in North Carolina. Of the total of uh, 2,751 Liberty ships, um, 126 were built by Newport News shipbuilding there in uh, North Carolina. And you can see it's very much of an assembly line method of uh, the less completed ships are off to the right, the more completed ships are to the left, the crews and workers move from one ship to another doing their, um, their work um, as the ship progresses, and they're launching uh, one ship every few days uh, at, the, at their peak. And Liberty ships were at war around the globe. Fleets, some of which you saw in the still from uh, Greyhound, uh, they were able to survive the uh, high seas of the North Atlantic, very slow, 10 knots, but they, they sailed in convoys, they went to the ends of the earth, and they brought uh, equipment from, from the United States, Canada, and elsewhere to everywhere on the globe. Now I wanna talk about the landing ship tank, LSTs. And this is from another Tom Hanks film. Saving Private Ryan, very famous scene um, at the end of the um, D-Day scene. And the thing you, you uh, should notice, uh, well, the first thing you'll probably immediately notice is uh, those are CGI um, LSTs, landing ship tanks, but they're also not uh, during that initial wave. These ships were far too valuable to bring in the initial assault. Um, this is what kept the supplies going in the follow-on echelons. So if you ever see a movie where you, an LST is in the front wave, somebody's uh, not telling the story accurately. This is accurate. There were hundreds of LSTs all along the beaches. And the elegy for LSTs was written probably best by Churchill himself. He said, and I'll quote him from his volume five of the Second World War. Um, in this period of the war, all the great strategic combinations of the Western powers were restricted and distorted by the shortage, not of tanks, but of vehicles. And the letters LST, landing ship tank, are burnt in the minds of all those who dealt uh, with military affairs in that period. All turned on LSTs. And that was absolutely critical because you needed that kind of ca carrying capacity 
to uh, make sure that not only were the first uh, uh, echelons supported, but then there was a continuous feed of men and equipment onto the shores for the next six months to eight months of uh, invading the continent. That's not quite what he said in April 1944, just before the D-Day invasion, which had to be pushed um, from May to June because of lack of LSTs, and Churchill wired George C. Marshall's, the destinies of two great empires seem to be tied up in some goddamn things called LSTs. Um, you won't find that in his histories, but you will find it in the actual um, archives. Um, the LST, and I had to write this one down, was the multi-purpose ship that was everything the Allies never knew they always wanted until it became available. Yeah, I know, that sounds like a bad romantic comedy. Um, but LSTs were absolutely vital, uh, and it wasn't understood how vital they would be until the British attempted to do um, uh, what they thought they could do, which is to um, land, a sh land a fleet of, uh, sorry, land uh, troops ashore, capture a city, and then bring the heavy equipment. The doctrine at the time was uh, the only way to bring heavy equipment like tanks and trucks and artillery and other vehicles was to capture a port that you could then crane all the stuff off the ships onto wharves and then drive it off. But in order to take a city, you needed to bring in troops. Well, Britain tried that in September of 1940 in Dakar, Senegal, against the uh, Vichy French, and it was a disaster. They simply could not get the troops um, onto the shore um, in any kind of orderly fashion, and then they found they needed heavy equipment in order to take the city. So it was this um, terrible cycle where they couldn't get tanks and other equipment onto the shore because they needed to take the city, but they couldn't take the city without heavy equipment. So in October of 1940, specifically October 27th, 1940, um, Churchill uh, gathered his staff around in a now disused underground station. That's the station. Um, it's the Down Street Tube Station, and that is the birthplace of the LST, and the birth date of the LST is October 27th, 1940, because that's when Churchill uh, explained to his staff that the problem was you couldn't take a, a port without heavy vehicles and tanks, but you couldn't um, land heavy vehicles and tanks because you couldn't take them across the ocean and uh, which require deep draft ships and put them on a beach which needs shallow draft to get up onto the beach. And he said, go solve the problem. Get the best engineering minds uh, in the country to figure out how you can take a tank across the ocean and land it on the beach in less than 10 feet of water. And that's the diagram that was drawn. And of course, we know that the best engineering minds in the country are naval architects. And the naval architect who was first assigned to this, he was called the naval constructor, is this man, Roland Baker, Royal Corps of Naval Constructors. And he was given the assignment, figure out how, do you, how to build a ship that can cross an ocean with tanks and land it on shore. And he came up with this concept just a few months later. Um, it was the first LST landing ship tank. And it had this, and let me make sure that this works. It had this bridge. So this was constructed by a, 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 a actually a bridge building company that could be uh, deployed from the bow of the ship, and you can barely see it here, um, across the waves and allow tanks to drive up over the waves and onto the beach. And it was a great idea, but they could only build about three of these things because this mechanism was very complicated. The design um, was relatively complicated and Britain simply didn't have the uh, people or the uh, industries to be able to build these, not in the few single or dozens, but in the hundreds and thousands that would be necessary 
to take the continent. Now, I want to point out that that picture of Roland Baker uh, is from one of my old professors uh, in Britain and a friend of mine, D.K. Brown, who was trained by Roland Baker and David K. Brown taught me how to design warships. So from him to Brown to me. Now, the Americans were aware of what was going on because of this man, Ned Cochran, another unsung hero. Uh, and he was at the forefront of Lend-Lease. Um, he was, the British call it, seconded. He was assigned to the British Admiralty, the Royal Corps of Naval Construction, uh, in 1940 to understand what the needs were of the British Navy for a whole host of things, how to fight submarines, how to operate in um, convoys, because the Americans in the fall of 1940 knew that, uh, at least the US Navy knew, that it was going to get into this war sooner or later, and they better know what it's going to take to um, get involved. So Cochrane was able to um, be part of the RCNC for several months, and I did that too, about 80 years later. Um, well, no, not 80, sorry, about 40 years later. Um, while uh, the uh, Americans and the British were talking, and uh, negotiations began, which culminated in the Lend-Lease program that started in March 1941. And immediately the British started coming to the United States, asking to build ships that they needed that Ned Cochran had already figured out um, would be of service to both the British and the Americans, primarily in anti-submarine warfare, um, but they were also starting to think about how they would build landing ship tanks. And those conversations um, culminated in uh, October and November of 1941. So there was a gestation period. Um, the British had sent another delegation uh, in the fall of 1941 to ask the Americans to build under Lend-Lease landing ships. So um, Cochrane, who was the head of the Bureau of Ships, came to um, his head of ship design, and this is John C. Niedermeyer, who trained my bosses um, when I worked in the Naval Sea Systems Command, um, who trained me on how to design warships, from John Niedermeyer to my bosses to me, so from the two sides. This is one of the things that got me very interested in this topic, as you probably figured out. I was able to contact the family of the Niedermeyers, and here's what happened. November 4th, 1941, about two o'clock in the afternoon, Cochrane sits down with Niedermeyer and says, here's a single sheet of paper. This is what the British are looking for. They want a ship that can go 10 knots and carry this many tanks and go this far. So Niedermeyer, in about the course of two hours, sits down with a sheet of paper, um, sketches it out, does a few calculations, um, and then he's got to leave because you can see that um, quitting time in the main Navy building in Washington, D.C. was everybody filing out. And Niedermeyer was one of the few people who had a car that uh, could drive in his carpool. And he had to get to that carpool to make sure they left on time because one of the carpool members was Hyman Rickover, who was a stickler for punctuality to the point where he told Niedermeyer, if, I'm, uh, if you ever get to the pickup point uh, where you're supposed to pick me up and I'm not there, keep going, which Niedermeyer did several times, once when it was pouring rain and Rickover was running after the car. Niedermeyer drove home to his, uh, to his house, that's the house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, had dinner, went upstairs to the second floor, this is where his study was, unrolled the sheet of paper, started drawing uh, a larger scale version of his LST uh, on that paper, um, on his tracing paper, his drafting table, six foot drafting table, um, asked the son to get him coffee, the son bought the coffee, spilled the coffee on the drawing, um, didn't have time to clean it up, rolled it up, went back to work the next day, they looked at it, the British delegation looked at it and said, yep, this is what we want. Coffee stain and all it was sent by courier to Britain who said, build me some of those. What did they build? 
they built what John Niedermeyer drew. Now, I know that perhaps in the back, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is his sketch. And it's on a sheet of paper about nine inches by four inches. Um, and I have listed in number four, number two pencil of a ship that can carry um, 500 tons of uh, tanks, land in about uh, two and a half or three feet of water. There's a lot more detail in here. This, for a naval architect, this is, this is the equivalent of seeing uh, an original drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, you know, of, of his Mona Lisa and how he figured out the, the muscles that, that work the smile. This is the equivalent. Because if you are able to look, and it's in my book, so that's another reason, you will see that the sketch he made is almost identical to the LST that was built almost exactly one year later. The sketch was um, dated November 4th, um, 1941. Uh, the LSTs uh, came, the first ones came off the line in just over one year from that point. By the way, um, Roland Baker, I want to point this out, um, was in the United States at this time and worked in Niedermeyer's office on the design of the LST. So the two together um, uh, actually developed the American LST. So why, why is this important? Um, because uh, at first, the Americans did not want to build the landing ship tank. They said, you British don't need this. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the, the, uh, the chief of naval operations, uh, who was briefed on the British LST program, told the British mission, you don't need this, so we're not going to build it. Um, he told them that on December 5th, 1941. The British came to the White House on December 6th, and um, Harry Hopkins, who was FDR's right-hand man, said, I don't know what the Navy thinks it's talking about. We need them. Let me see if I can get Roosevelt tomorrow. That was Saturday, December 6th, 1941. December 7th, within a, within a few days, the uh, uh, FDR said, I don't, we're, we're going to build these, and uh, we're going to build them for the Americans. And so very quickly, the LST became an American program, just like with the Liberty ship. Detailed design went to Gibbs and Cox. Um, most of the shipyards that built the LSTs were these prairie shipyards along the um, uh, uh, Mississippi River, Ohio River, Dravo, Evansville, Chicago Bridge. Um, eventually, 16 shipyards uh, built the LST, including Newport News and Kaiser in Vancouver. They were so critical to the war effort that here at Newport News, um, uh, one of the carriers that was under construction, the CV-13 Franklin um, on Slipway 11, nice detail, huh? Um, was taken off out of the slipway so they could build six LSTs. And you don't move an aircraft carrier uh, for no reason. So this tells you how important the United States considered it. The very first LST, which was the uh, 383, was delivered on October, was delivered, sorry, I was wrong, October 27th, 1942. Um, and where was it delivered? Newport News. And there's LST 383 um, in a trial launching a smaller landing craft um, off of it. Uh, you can see that uh, the um, the local crowd was dedicate or, or uh, had a ceremony to launch these LSTs. And the supervisor of shipbuilding, Soup Ship, said just a year later, of the various building yards, this is to Newport News, um, you were next to last to start, and that was absolutely true. Dravo on the Mississippi was the first one to start. But you, Newport News, were the first ones to complete the vessels. Um, there were a total of 1,000. 50 LSTs built, 18 of them at Newport News. Um, who, who ordered them originally? The British? They got 113. We got the rest. And they were used um, all across the world, most famously in uh, the invasion of Normandy, as I said. They were uh, in the follow-up echelons. They weren't 
Uh, this is an actual picture. This is not a CGI. Um, and they were used for the buildup for the invasion. They, they delivered tanks, vehicles, equipment. Um, they launched landing craft. They evacuated casualties and uh, POWs. They became hospital ships. They became command ships. They became repair ships. They even launched aircraft. In Normandy alone, there were 230 LSTs carrying equipment, supplies, and people across the channel. And in the Pacific, uh, the Marine Corps, which is uh, one of the most innovative uh, agencies in the entire federal government, uh, figured out how to use LSTs not to land directly on the shores, but to launch these um, amphibious tractors called Amtraks, uh, which were the only things shallow enough to go up over the reefs and into the atolls to go on their island hopping campaign. Even the famous Higgins boats um, couldn't be used all that uh, often and as effectively as LSTs with these Amtraks, which would deploy uh, to 100, 200 would come ashore and just overwhelm the invaders. So LSTs and Liberty ships, um, both of which were British and American projects, both of which um, have part of their heritage here in the Newport News area were absolutely essential for winning the war. Um, I just want to point out, and some of you already know this, that uh, uh, there are remaining examples of both. Um, the LST 325 Museum in Evansville, Illinois, uh, Indiana, um, which I've been to. And uh, that's the, the uh, John W. Brown in Baltimore is the closest one to here, but there's another Liberty ship in um, San Francisco, the Jeremiah Brown, and one in Piraeus, uh, just outside of Athens. Um, these, two shipyard, these two ships, as I said, were products of Newport News, but they were the product, more importantly, of the amazing, intense cooperation between the United States and Britain. And it's these alliances and this cooperation that is critical to maintaining strength around the globe. Um, nations that have the best and most long-lasting alliances are the ones that last and maintain their strength the longest. This is a lesson that we know even today, and it's our alliances and it's our ability to cooperate around the world that makes us, even today, not just in World War II, the indispensable nation. Thank you.